Glad, glad to be here today and want to thank you for giving us the privilege and the honor really to come back. Uh, we don't take that lightly and I know God wants to and can and I believe he will do great things with this church. You just keep at it. That's the main thing. The Christian life is about perseverance. Uh, as Brother Jason pointed out about you know facing obstacles, facing things sometimes, you just keep going. I mean, you live a life and it doesn't end. You know, when you get to a certain uh, point, I talked to, to one of your men, I had three daughters and they're all grown now. And that part of my life is over. I don't have responsibility for them anymore, but now I'm on to a new phase. You know, God has given me the opportunity to work at our church, Heritage Baptist, where I've been able to go on staff. And, I, and years ago, if you had told me that would have happened, I never would have, would have dreamed that would have happened. So, but God has brought me to a new phase. So you're, God is constantly having you do something. And isn't that neat? I mean, you get to serve your whole life a great God, the one that we have. So this afternoon, or this morning rather, this afternoon, I think we're still in morning, aren't we, for another hour. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter number 3. We're going to actually go to a couple of chapters in Acts. Um, I'm going to read about 10 or 11 verses just to kind of set the tone on what's going on. Chapter number 3, we're going to start reading verses 1 through 4. Since I'm moving around, I'll let you remain seated. But Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Drop down to verse 7. And he, it, he took him up by the right hand after he had called on the name of Jesus and immediately lifted and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entering with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the temple saw him walking and praising God. Now turn over to Acts chapter 4. We'll read verses 1 and 2 then 14 through 17, then we'll pray and ask God to bless. Verses 1 and 2 of Acts chapter 4. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And down at verse 14 of that same chapter, beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they, that's referring to the same group of people in verse 1 and 2, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go outside of the temple, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that spread, listen to this, but that spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no men in his name. Question for you this morning. Two situations in this passages. Are you a witness or are you religious? Are you a witness or are you religious? We're going to see both kinds in these passages I read this morning. We're going to look at it for the next few minutes. Let's go ahead and pray and ask God to bless Father, thank you for this day. I, I, Lord, I do truly thank you for the opportunity to stand before this good group of people and to share the Bible with them. Lord, it's exciting to talk about the Bible. Lord, I pray that you'd be with other services going around. I, pray, I know Brother Houston is in a place this morning. Please bless that service. Bless Heritage Church in Lawrence this morning, Lord, as they have their service. Lord, but I pray right now you'd bless our time. Lord, give me exactly what, what I need, what this group of people need that Christ might be uplifted and edified. Lord, surely I don't know the spiritual condition of everyone here, but most certainly if there's anyone here not saved today, I pray that they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior today. But Lord, at the very least, they'd, they'd walk away with a renewed commitment, a renewed zeal to, to serve you. And thank you that we can do that, Lord. And we ask you to be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Now think about being religious. I think about myself growing up. I grew up 
and was raised in a Catholic church, went to a, a Catholic grade school, went to a Catholic high school. From grades one through eight, every morning before school, we lined up and went over to Mass Monday through Friday. And then on Sunday, we went to Mass because, because that was what we were expected to do. So six days a week for years, I went to Mass. And what was interesting about that, the priest would come in, and I always fasc was fascinated by the robes he wore. You know, I, I don't remember all what each color was associated with, but their different color robes are normally, if I remember right, they're associated with different times of the year, different like Lent or Easter, things like that. But some of the robes were so colorful, and I thought, wow. It almost looked mystic. Just, wow, that's, that's the priest, and he's dressed like this. You almost were afraid to go near him. And that was kind of tough when you were in all like I was a couple years. I mean, you had to go near him, right? But, I mean, it was just so mysterious. I mean, you see people like that today. I mean, some of these religious people, different groups, they're, they're just, oh, they look so, wow. And you're kind of awestruck by them. And it's all good. It's all, it's all pomp. It's all nice. It's all fancy. But I realized later on in my life, I didn't get saved in a Christian home. Listen to the testimonies of, of Brother Jason and, and others, I'm sure, of you. I didn't get saved in a Christian home. I, my parents weren't saved till later in their lives. Praise the Lord. They did get saved before they, went, before they died. But all that religion really did me no good. It didn't, it didn't convict me. It didn't show the gospel to me. It didn't tell me my need of a Savior. It didn't show me I was a sinner. All it did was make me really behave in church because I was afraid the nuns would make me come back and sit by them if I got out of line. And I'm not making fun of them. All I'm pointing out as I think back of the memory is that, and I'll say this again, we have a lot of religion today. 21st, you know, what we need to have today, I guess is my point, and I'm going to challenge you now and later, we really need a good old-fashioned New Testament witness, not 21st century religion. Friends, we have plenty of religion. We really do. We have a jail ministry, and I tell the men in there all the time, we have religion. Do you know, and probably some of you know this, that in the United States of America, one out of every five people are not affiliated with any type of religion at all. They don't claim it. And when I first saw that statistic, in that group are the atheists. But when I first saw that, I couldn't believe that. Because when I was growing up, everybody went to a church of some kind. But now 20% of the country goes nowhere. Why? Because we've had too much religion and not enough, not enough New Testament witness. Let's look at these two things, these two scenarios this morning. First of all, I want to look at the witness because really that's the most important one. In verse number uh, 2 and 3 and 4 of chapter number 3, we see a situation of this lame man. The Bible tells us that this man was lame from his mother's womb. I mean, so in other words, he was lame his whole life. Later on, the Bible tells us that the man was over 40 years old. So for over 40 years, this man couldn't walk. He was lame. Now, that's bad enough today. We do have wheelchairs. We do have things that can aid. That would be tough enough, though. I don't want to discount that. But can you imagine this time? I mean, really, you look at this man's situation. What did he have to look forward to? I mean, every day somebody had to carry him to the temple and sit him down at the gate and say, well, have a good day. As he laid there all day long, hoping that if somebody came by, they'd feel sorry enough for him to give him a few cents, a few pieces of food, just something that he could live. I mean, it was literally a day-to-day -day existence for this man. Encouragement? What kind of encouragement was there? I mean, they didn't have the medicines we have. This man surely had to think, this is how I'm going to die, a lame man. I mean, what am I saying? I'm saying he had no hope. What a life. Could you just picture yourself if that was your life, what you had to look forward to every day of the week, every week of the year, being laid at the temple, with nothing to do but sit there and look and watch people look by and look at you and say, well, that poor guy. And hope they give you some hope you could live. Doesn't say where he lived. Can't imagine where he lived. I mean, I could guess, but doesn't say. 
But would you agree with me that the man had some needs? He had most definitely physical needs, but he also had spiritual needs. And what I want to say, every one of us have needs. He's a good picture of the spiritual condition of our lives. As he had physical needs, he also had spiritual needs. More important than his physical needs were his spiritual needs. Because we see from Peter dealing with him that obviously the man wasn't saved. Friends, we have, every man has spiritual needs. The first thing we have to come to realization of before we can get saved is that we're sinners. That's it. We need to realize we have a need. And, 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 as, and as America becomes more and more against religion, you run to more and more people that don't want to admit they have that need, that they are sinners. But make no mistake about it, I don't care how good we think we are, how much church we go to, how much we read the Bible, if you read it 15 hours a day, that doesn't make you to the point where you don't have a need. You, reading the Bible by itself is not going to get you saved. It's trusting in Christ. We have a need. This man had a need. You and I have a need. The whole world has a need. But we also have not only the man with the need, but the one who understood, one of the one, two of the ones who understood this man's need and decided to do something about it. Here comes Peter and John, two apostles. They say, well, Brother Mark, they're apostles. They should have witnessed to him. Okay. That's easy to say. But is that reality? No. They were going to the they were going to the temple to pray. Most people would have thought they'd have been good if they'd have given this man some money. Even though Peter said they didn't have any. You know, but if, what if they would have given him something? What if they would just lay down and, or, or bent down, shook his hand, and say, God bless you, brother? We do that. Let me let me say that real quickly. We do that a lot. Someone who, who, who has a need, God bless you. And we don't do anything to help them. Shame on us if that's us. But Peter and John realized this man had a need. And they knew it was more than a physical need because no Peter said in verse number 4 of chapter 3, Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John and said, look on us. He, what was he trying to do? He was trying to get this man focused off his physical condition and to look at him and he was going to get him to realize he had a spiritual need. We go soul winning and we share the gospel with people. That's what you're doing. You're trying to show, you're trying to get people the whole, to see that they have a spiritual need. We preach the gospel to try to, to try to get people to see they have a spiritual need. We can't do it in and of ourselves. Obviously, the Holy Spirit has got to do it. But, that, but he uses this to convict people, to show them they have a spiritual need. We need the boldness. I'll, I'll be the first to confess to you, I don't witness enough. I don't pass out tracts enough. And shame on me. I, I really want to get better at that. I'm not where I want to be. If you, if you don't pass on any tracts at all, or nobody knows you're a Christian, friends, I want to encourage you. Get some boldness. You say, well, Brother Mark, that's tough. Yeah, it is tough. Hey, I am not a natural one to go do that. The people I don't know to, to hand them a tract, that's not me. But you know what? I get shamed when I, when I get with good godly people, it's godly men, and see them do it to everybody. And I think, you know, if they can do it, why can't I? I serve the same God they do. But see, we, gotta get, we have to get bold. See, Peter and John saw this man's need. They realized he had it. And it wasn't good enough for Peter just to say, God bless you. They wanted to do something about it. So Peter did. He said, look on us. And he knew he had enough confidence in Jesus that he would help him and, and take care of the situation and meet this man's need. Friends, we need, to, we need to be bold. We need to have that boldness of the apostles. Why? If we do... The results can be life-changing. Look at this man. Peter said, look, I don't have anything to give you, but what I have, I'll give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. Peter took him by the right hand and lifted him. And immediately, The Bible says in verse number 7, immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Immediately, not a day later, not a, immediately the man's need was met. Look at the life-changing results. Do you think this man was appreciative of it? Absolutely. In verse number 8, he leaped up, stood, and walked, entering with him in the temple, walking and leaping and praised God. Do you think that man's life will ever be the same again? Was it ever the same again? No. 
The gospel is, look, it's life changing. A person gets saved or a saved person grows spiritually. Friends, if, if you're saved this morning, you know what I'm saying is true. That's life changing. I got saved. I lived for years for myself, had no interest in the gospel or anything, got saved. and It just changes your perspective on everything, what you want to do. It's, not, it's no longer about you. It's about everybody else, other people. It's life-changing. You can't trust Christ as your Savior and your life be the same. You can't. It's impossible. That's why the Bible says in Corinthians, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. This man experienced the healing of Jesus Christ, and his life was never the same again. Friends, if you're a witness for Christ and you share the gospel and you live such a life that people know you're a Christian, I promise you, It'll have, an, it'll have results. It'll have positive results. It'll have life-changing results. My parents both, I mentioned that they were, that they were Catholic. I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and that's true. Uh, my parents both were very, well, especially my mother was very staunch Catholic, very diehard. And they both wound up getting saved in their 50s because of the persistence, of, in, in my mom's case, the persistence of my late wife of her persistence in keeping by her to church. And mom eventually came and got saved. And, and, I, and I, I may have told this here, but that's all right, I'll repeat it. Hey, I gave up on her. After, after inviting her for a while, I just gave up. Thought, well, she'll never come. But my wife never gave up. And as a result, mom not only came to church, but mom wound up getting saved. And she passed away, and she's been dead for a long time now, but do you think the results were life-changing in her case? Amen. Absolutely. Friends, we need to have, we need to have a witness like that. That's what, that's what this country needs. We talk about the political landscape. We talk about you know, different things going on, cuts in the military, things like that. And it all can be kind of ominous. But to be honest, it all comes back down to we need people to get saved. We need the gospel. If the president of our country, if the leaders of our country got, really got saved and committed to this Bible, it, they would turn this country topsy-turvy back to the way it used to be. That's what we need to have. And the only way that's going to happen is if we Christians get about busy with the witness that God wants us to do. You know, I know when I was younger, I, keep, I, I used to think to myself, well, the pastor will do it. You know, the deacons will do it. Somebody else will do it. But, but God be worked on me, and again, I, I don't want you to think that I think I'm, you know, great at this. I've just got tons to go, but hey, God began to, to kind of work on me. Think, it's not their responsibility. Yours too. You're a Christian. So I wanted to let all the, the leaders of the church do it. After all, that's what they're there for. Friends, if you're saved in this pew this morning, it's yours and mine. <coughs> Because there's somebody in this world you could be a testimony to. There's somebody you can pray for. There's somebody you can tell. But you need to be a witness. I look at Peter and John. They saw this man's need, and they had the boldness, and they met it. And that's what we need to have today. Of course, if you're not saved today, you need to trust Christ. That brings me to our second group of people. We have the witness. Let's go to the religious people. Can't, i got to talk about them. So this man's saved, and he's leaping, praising God, and just having a good time, and everybody's excited. Well, there's always someone to throw cold water on excitement. In chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, the priests, the Sadducees. doesn't say Pharisees, but I'm sure they were there as well. Some of the scribes, they were all there. And they were, in verse 2 of chapter 4, they were grieved that they taught the people. And preach through Jesus, the resurrected dead. Could you imagine that? Now, now, get this. They're grieved. But you go down to verse number 14. Beholding the man was healed standing with him, they could say nothing against us. They see this man who they knew had been lame his whole life. I mean, they saw it. He's not lame anymore. But they're grieved. That defies logic. Why? Because they're supposed to be the religious people. 
They should have been leaping, jumping, walking around, praising God. Oh no, they were grieved. Why were they grieved? Well, they were grieved because religious religion is self-centered. It's self-serving, it's self-seeking, and it's self-centered. What do you mean? It's self-serving the fact that all they want, all, when you're self-serving, being religious, you want to please yourself. These men here, they wanted to please themselves. They liked their position. And they didn't want to upset the apple cart. They didn't want to upset, they didn't want to upset their position with Rome. They didn't want Rome to get mad. So they, they wanted to plead. They, hey, they were comfortable. I mean, they could sit. If they wanted to exact another tax on the people, they had the authority to do it. If they wanted to throw somebody out of the synagogue, they could do that. They were the leaders. What a great place to be in. Man, they don't want to lose that. They were, they were good. Life was great. Why change that? Serving self, but they were also seeking after themselves. They wanted more. They, they, they wanted that to continue. They wanted that to go on. And they didn't want these, these upstart apostles preaching another doctrine. Good grief. Were they crazy? That'll mess us up. Rome might not be happy with that. We might, we might have to, oh my, we might have to give up a little bit of our excess. <laughs> Good grief. Isn't that terrible? Terrible. People might not look upon us as highly as they did once before. The world's coming to an end. But it boils down to they were totally self-centered. That's all they were focused on was themselves. I mean, look at this situation. Here's a man who for 40 years of his life was unable to walk and was a pitiful beggar outside the temple. But they couldn't see the, the glory of God working in this man's life and not only healing him, but spiritually healing him as well as the way he reacted evidences, all they could see was the fact that, that they're preaching the doctor of that Nazarene again. They, all they could see was themselves. Shouldn't they have been rejoicing with this man? But see that if they rejoice, then they have to admit, we crucified Jesus. They didn't want to do that. Heaven forbid we admit we're wrong. Heaven forbid we admit that, oh, we don't know everything. Heaven forbid there's something bigger than us. You see, when you're self-centered and religious, anything outside of yourself is a threat. Anything outside of them was a threat. Here's Peter and John, two unknowns. They said, you read the, that account in Acts, it says they were astonished because they were unlearned. They hadn't been trained in one of the, the, the schools of the rabbis. Oh, no, they didn't get the proper education. But they, took, but they took knowledge that they'd been with Jesus. That should have said it all, but it didn't to them. They hadn't been trained. What are they doing, doing these things? We can't have this. So... They did the thing that good spiritual people do. Good religious spiritual people. We can't deny the man saved, but we're going to stop it. No more people getting healed. No more healings. No, if they're saying they're going to stay that way. We're not going to mess them up. We're not going to mess our situation up. They're going to stay lame. So we'll beat the apostles and threaten them. Don't do this anymore. Lunacy, isn't it? Lunacy. But that's religion. That's religion. Friends, what we need to do today, what you and I need to do, we need to get our eyes off ourselves. We need to get our eyes off ourselves. And, and, and I think every person at some point gets their eyes on themselves. I mean, we've all been there. I've been there. We've all been there. But we can't stay there. We, we've got to move. I mean, you look at the response of these guys, and it's just, I, it, I can't even comprehend it. Looking at a man who's been lame for 40 years, totally healed, they couldn't deny it. And yet, rather than being happy about it, they wanted to attack those who, who were behind it. The, by the way, this is the same group of people that when Stephen preached, it says that they, 
that they stopped their ears and they gnashed on him with their teeth. This is the same group of people. When Stephen preached, they began to bite him. Every time I read that, though that account, I just, how could, <laughs> I try to picture what that'd be like today. I mean, that'd be like if I went to KU and I, I guess I started preaching the gospel and, and a bunch of college professors started to, to bite on me. I mean, that, that's, that's what it'd be like, right? I mean, but that's what's like here. These guys, you know, you get up in the, and of course, some of this does happen. You, you would get up in a class and take a stand for Christianity. They're going to tell you, shut up. But it's the same thing here. But it's religion. We could go down, the, we could go down and talk about a lot of denominations. Th there's all kinds. You know, and I like studying denominations. It's an interesting study. But you study about where churches began and where they came out of. It's religion. And friends, the world has always had too much of that. Here, these, these, these religious people wanted to stop it. But they weren't going to be able to do that because you're never going to be able to contain this book totally. Never. You're never going to be able to, sh to stop the witness about Christ totally. Never. But the devil's group's going to try. But see, you and I can't allow ourselves to become a part of that. We can't, we, we've got to be, we've got to be witnesses, not religious. Peter told that lame man, look on us. In other words, he's saying, don't look at your condition, don't look at yourself, but look for what I've got for you. I've got something to help you. And he did. He not only healed him, but it's evidence the man got saved because of his praising God and his reaction. See, religion will cause you to be critical. Religion will cause you to be content. And religion will cause you to really just live your life and not accomplish anything. A witness, on the other hand, will cause you to look at other people. It will cause you to be interested in their well-being. It will cause you to be concerned when they have troubles. It will cause you to not be content with just being a, a uh, person in the audience, but to be someone that wants to get in the middle of things. And the question I want to have for you today is to examine yourself. Because only you and God know where you're at. To examine yourself and ask yourself, are you a little too much, too much religious? Or are you a witness? Or you say, well, Brother Mark, I'm really trying to be a witness. Well, praise the Lord. To ask, then you could, I would ask God to help you be more of a witness. Friends, we can't be content because honestly, I, I, I hear too many men of God today say they think Christ is coming back soon, and I don't doubt that at all with the condition of the world the way it is. Time is going to be short, and there's too many people that are not saved yet. There's too much to do for us to be religious. Okay, We've got to be a witness. We've got to take the bull by the, the horn, so to speak, and get about busy. And I want to encourage you to do that today. But if you're in this group today, if you're in this audience, and you're not saved, well, you, don't, you can't even do that yet. Okay? What you need to do, first of all, you say, man, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Well, what you need to do then is what this man did, place his trust in Christ, to admit that you're a sinner, to realize that you can't save yourself, that you can't work your way to heaven, coming to church won't get you to heaven, being religious won't get you to heaven, but only by a trust in Christ can you get to heaven. Okay? By trusting in him. And as simply as you know how, like Brother Jason mentioned, he prayed a prayer, and I had a similar experience to that, praying a prayer. It's not the prayer. The prayer is not magical. It's not mystical. It's the faith that saves you. The prayer is simply a confession of what the heart believes. Okay? You pray to God, but your heart already believes. You already believe. You already got it, you already got it convinced in yourself that he is that, and you ask him to do that. It's the faith, that trust that saves you. Okay? If you've never done that today, do that as best as you know how. Ask Jesus to save you and to forgive your sins. If you don't, uh, you're not sure how to do that, then I'd ask you during the invitation to, to come forward and someone will take a Bible and show you how to do that. We can, there's enough people that can do that. But if nothing else today, I want to encourage you. If you're saved, you say, Brother Mark, I'm saved and I've been saved. Praise the Lord. But as we look at this account, we constantly need to keep challenging ourselves. Do we want to be more of a witness, or do we want to fall back in the, in the mode of being religious? It, it's your choice today, but I hope 
that for, for the sake of the Lord and for the testimony of the gospel, we choose, we want to be the witness. Because again, the results are life changing. They are. They're, they're life changing. And one day, it'll be worth it all. When we see him, we go to heaven. Let's pray.